welcome everybody to the, the final webinar of the Golf Ireland Gender Equality series. Um, so over the past three weeks, it's been really kind of exciting to see so many people engaged and, and enjoying these webinars. So we thank you all for, for getting involved and, and coming to tune in again today. Um, again, before we begin, as always, you can use the Q&A box uh, function below to submit any questions that you might have. Uh, and please do use that function so you can ask us to discuss anything that you were thinking of at home. Um, so our first panelist today is Nora Stapleton, um, who's the Women in Sport Lead at Sport Ireland. Um, so in 2019, Sport Ireland launched their Women in Sport policy, which ultimately inspired a lot of uh, work that has been done by NGBs across the whole island, um, including the Level Par programme. So one of the key actions of this policy was the appointment of a Women in Sport Lead to, to ultimately develop and promote women and girls involvement in all sports. Um, so Nora previously worked with the IRFU uh, as their women and girls development manager uh, before taking up the role as women in sport lead in, in April 2019. Um, she's a former Irish international rugby player um, and was also involved in the, or I suppose leading the way on the, the Give It A Try campaign with the IRFU, which saw a lot of girls getting involved in rugby. So I welcome Nora and thank you very much for joining us today. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, I might just, yeah, I think you've introduced me enough. There's not much more to say, but uh, as you mentioned, um, I'm in Wolf Sport Ireland now for since April 2019. So I literally came in the door as the, the NGBs had submitted their applications um, for their women in sport funding. So I had to hit the ground running and straight in getting involved with that. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me here today. I guess what I'm going to do is do a sh very short presentation, maybe just to set the scene a little bit um, on the policy itself, why we need the policy, and then really just try and focus on participation and um, drawing on my own, um, my own background and experience, I guess, from Eider Sport Ireland, uh, from the IRFU, which you mentioned, and then I also worked for the GEA for about six years. I was a games promotional officer in a local club here in Dublin. So very much came from grassroots um, and I've worked my way through different levels of sports uh, and organization of sports. So hopefully I can draw on a bit of that and just share with whoever's listening in today. So give me a sec here now and we'll just share this and we'll get going. Okay, so um, should be a PowerPoint up in front of you there. So, I mean, the Women in Sport Policy. So, as we spoke about, it was launched in March 2019, and it was came off a couple of key pillars that we um, wanted to ensure that we were implementing in order to make those changes that we thought necessary through Women in Sport. So, what were the key target areas that Sport Ireland felt were important? I have active participation here because obviously that was one of our key areas and something that we're focusing on today. Um, but a big one for us is was to reduce that uh, participation gradient between men and women. So I guess when, when Sport Ireland first started funding women in sport programs, it was way back in 2005. Uh, and that came about from research from the ESRI who said, you know, they stated that the participation gradient between men and women was 15.7%. So um, it was quite broad. Over the kind of last however number of years, um, that gradient has been going down, which is fantastic to see. In 2017, when they looked at it again, it had reduced to 4.5. Um, and it was after they saw that that they decided to reshape the program a little bit and make it far more targeted. Uh, now, when we look at that participation gradients, we're down to 3.9. So it's reduced even further. So it really shows that men and women are nearly exercising equally. However, that's not the case when we get to teenage girls and I have a couple of things, a couple of slides to show you on that one. Um, and hence why a big focus of ours is reducing that dropout among young girls. Uh, the other pillar then we'll touch on briefly is coaching and officiating. So we want to broaden the coaching base um, and broaden the officiating base basically. So more there are more coaches at grassroots, but more importantly that more coaches are progressing through to the higher levels of coaching. Um, from a leadership and governance point of view then, uh, currently, uh, we have 28% females on boards across our national governing bodies. Um, so it's something that we're really trying to work on that we're progressing towards greater gender balance um, across our boards as a whole. And I, I know it was great to see golf 
advertised board roles recently um, and to hear that they had a high number of females applying for those roles because it's just it's vital that we we start developing the females that are in the pipeline but also that we start seeing um, actions such as that from golf where we're actively recruiting for females and telling the population that we want more females on our boards. And then the final one is visibility. So how do we increase the profile of our female role models in sports? And um, so role models there, it's not just your athletes, but how do we ensure that coaches, referees um, are all very much visible in sport as well? And again, using our Olympians and Paralympians where we can. Uh, but active participation is where we're going to look at. Before we go back to that though, um, just quickly on why we need the policy. So obviously a lot of research was done before the policy was produced. Um, and these are some of the key things that would have come out of it, which is why we picked the pillars that we did. So when you look at coaching figures, um, you can see there the approximate ratio of male to females, both in coaching and refereeing. Uh, we have two female high performance directors across our sports. And then when you look at the breakdown across the various levels, and I know all sports are different, so um, the various levels in golf will be different to maybe rugby or athletics, et cetera. But this just gives you an overall. You can see how um, basically the female percentage starts dropping off the higher they progress within sports and coaching. Um, boards then, so I mentioned the current stats, but this you know, just gives you an idea of some of the NGBs that would have, well, I guess what we would consider quite a positive board composition where they have um, between that 60, 40% um, males, females on boards. And then we still have a lot of NGBs that are 10% or less. Uh, but the main thing is here is that we have gone in the last year from 24% to 29%. Um, we're currently looking at it at the minute to get a, a new stat on that, and it may have dropped 28%, which kind of shows us, well, are we still growing or have we plateaued? And then what interventions do we need to, to make? When we talk a little bit about print media, just to show you quickly and why it's such a key area, and, um, and I know like this, these type of stats would have been shared multiple times, but you know, you're talking in and around 4% of females in the print media. Um, it hasn't changed much in the last number of years, uh, which is why you need more key measures in that place. But when you look at the different types of print media, you can see that the likes of the sun would be worse again, than, say the likes of the Irish Times. So it's very much the, the type of newspaper as well can determine how much uh, coverage they give to women in sport. Um, this then is, I think, an important graph to show, but this is the number of boys and girls who meet the National Physical Activity Guidelines, which is they exercise every day, 60 minutes a day. So you can see the difference there between boys and girls, which is why we really do focus on, um, you know, why we develop initiatives, girls only initiatives from time to time, because we want to, we, we want to increase the numbers who are participating, but also we want to stem that dropout. Um, when we look at sports then, so this graph will show you the proportion of girls and boys playing community sports at least once a week. So community sports could be your golf. That's the number for the boys. And then this is the number for the girls. So as they progress through the ages, you can see there, you know, when they're kind of 12, 13, boys and girls roughly play the same amount um, in their clubs. But as they get older, the girls drop off. Okay, so we're obviously trying to come up with some strong interventions in, in order to try and stop that. When we look at, and just that highlights that 40% of girls, less than 40% of girls are playing sport in their community. When we look at the numbers who play at least four times a week, because you know we say they should be playing four times a week at a minimum, that's your number for the boys. And then the girls is just a steady decline. So again, it just really emphasizes that we don't just, for example, we're not just funding women in sport um, programs or initiatives because it's a nice thing to do and an attractive thing to do is because we've done the research and we can see that the numbers are so different. And so we need to have other interventions there. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing that for a minute uh, and just come out of it. And guess, and maybe just in the last couple of minutes is touch on um, some of my own experience and how we're using this information. And um, so when we talk about participation, I, we saw there in the graph that boys and girls around the age of 12 can have a tendency to play sports at an equal level. Um, I obviously worked in rugby prior to this. And in 2013, when Ireland won the Grand Slam, uh, 
was probably this is like the first thing we ever won in women's rugby. But when we won that, uh, I was working in Nairobi. I just literally come through the door. I'd only started a couple of months before. Um, and suddenly I got all these, you know, emails saying, oh, my girl wants to play rugby. Where can she go? Or, um, you know, where's her nearest club? All these types of emails. And a lot of them were from, there were some definitely, you know, teenagers wanting to play. But there were a lot of parents emailing about their seven-year-old, their 10-year-old, their 12-year-old. Now, up until then, we would promote mixed mini rugby. You know, mini rugby is huge in rugby clubs. There's waiting lists, you know, just they can't take in everybody who wants to play. But up until then, girls were more than welcome to play with the boys. Now, if a girl arrives down to a rugby club and starts playing at the age of seven, when the boys are all starting playing at the age of seven, they grow up through the rugby teams together. And the girls are, feel just as comfortable and just as capable as the boys of playing rugby. When a girl is 10 or 11 or 12 and she sees the national team doing well or she sees um, her local, you know, whoever doing well or she decides, you know what, I want to play this new sport. When she arrived down into the rugby club as a 10 year old or a 12 year old, the boys had already been playing together. She was the only girl that stepped into that team. Um, she didn't know the rules. She had to learn all the skills from the first time. And it was just such an unwelcoming environment for her. So we, we saw this, so we had loads of girls who started playing rugby, joined their mixed rugby team, didn't enjoy it and fell off again. Um, so we, we missed out on all those girls. So I looked at it and I was like, actually, we need to, you know, following on from some of the stuff of what Ladies GA are doing in Camogie, we probably need to develop girls only mini rugby teams here because they're just not staying when they join the boys team for the first time. So in 2013, we developed the initiative. We rolled it out. We piloted it in 2013. We rolled it out in 2014. In um, 2012, we had no clubs with girls mini only teams. In 2013, we trialed it in Connacht. We ended up with six clubs with two teams in each club. We rolled it out again in 2014 and expanded across the various provinces. We ended up with 20 clubs that then had girls only mini rugby teams. And we set up a whole program around it. You know, the clubs would register for it. There was a step-by-step -step guide as to how they set it up. All the participants got t-shirts. You know yourself, but you're a normal kind of program. Um, in Ireland now, there's only about 200 and I think there's 260 rugby clubs in Ireland. Um, I believe they're up to about 100 of those have girls only mini rugby teams. So now that now there are clubs that have a pathway for girls the whole way through from mini to adult. The whole purpose of doing this, though, wasn't just to get more girls playing rugby. Uh, rugby clubs tended to be very male dominant, I guess, unless there was an adult rugby team, which, you know, adult rugby started, adult women's rugby started before girls rugby. There really wasn't much presence of females in the club. So by starting the girls mini rugby, it, it suddenly opened up and opened up people's perceptions and views where they could see young girls playing rugby. They could see that it was no different to the boys playing rugby and they could see how much they enjoyed it. They started getting more of the parents in, the mums, the dads, who were just very much, my girl wants to play the same as my son. So now the rugby club became a place for the whole family rather than just a place where the boys went to play. And um, so it was all about changing that culture within the club, which was absolutely vital. And um, if I stay with that as well, I mean, I'm involved in a rugby club myself. When I first joined that rugby club, we would have had to set up a separate female administration system, for want of a better word. Um, over the years, it was a case of, no, actually, this isn't working. It has to be all about integration. So we spent a long time, um, not, not too long, but it was all about how do we ensure that females are integrated through the whole path of the, the whole uh, governance structure of the club? Um, and vice versa, how do we ensure that the, you know, the males are involved in the female side of the club as well? Um, and that has just worked wonders. You know, it was the club streamed our match there at the weekend live across their, their Facebook channel. And um, there's much more shared budgets, et cetera, et cetera. And um, females have, a, you know, they're bringing their working environment and their business environment into the club where they're able to bring in external sponsors and things like that. So it's really just because of that shared resource and that shared knowledge um, of, you know, men's, women's rugby all working together within the club it's really opened up so many more doors. And so I guess, you know, I really have probably rolled back into my own experience there as opposed to purely talking about uh, Sport Ireland and what we're doing there. But to go back on that briefly, 
you know, it's absolutely fantastic to see that the funding that Sport Ireland have awarded to the NGBs and especially golf and the level power program. Um, we saw it as being something critical to ensure that the amalgamation between the two unions uh, would be, I'm not going to say seamless because I know nothing like that is, but that there are support structures in place to help that amalgamation, which was absolutely vital. Um, and that those support structures would flow down through clubs as well and not just be at a, a, a high, like a board level, basically, that it would flow down through. And the Level Power is just one of the programmes um, that we would fund. Obviously, the rest of the programmes are spread out across each of the four pillars that we've mentioned. Um, and, you know, hopefully with the, the budget that was announced yesterday, we're hopeful that the women's sport funding will remain the same or will increase and we'll be able to continue uh, funding sports to implement these women in sport programs because as we've seen we need more female leaders we need to be developing our female leaders we need to be developing our female coaches uh, looking at what requirements what needs they need the same with referees we need our standalone female participation programs in order to increase the numbers that are playing our sport and to just give them that environment that they enjoy um, so I'll stop waffling now. And as I said, thanks for having me on board, Carla and Anne, and to look forward to any questions that anybody might ask. Thanks. I think it, it's important that um, the doesn't mean just the players or just the in terms of girls. And actually on the golf course, it is a whole, it goes down into coaching and administration and, administration and everything. Um, and I just want to touch on one thing you mentioned there about the, around the whole culture and um, I suppose, how much does, so like all of us here are club members or have maybe have some involvement in our own clubs as, as well as in the, the governing body, but how much do sort of assumptions about or, or preconceived notions about what a girl wants or what a woman wants or what a man wants or what a boy wants, how much can that maybe affect how we, I suppose, implement certain activities at our club? Yeah, um, and I definitely can. I mean, in my own club, I went to Ikea and bought a load of fake flowers and put them in the toilets because the place just didn't look well. But the men in the club perhaps didn't notice that or didn't realize that the appearance of the facility, um, it can be the difference between you getting a new member and not getting a new member. Um, it can be the difference between a parent dropping off their child and using the bathroom and being a bit like, oh, this is a bit grubby, I'm not sure about this. Um, so there are, certainly differences, um, but they're healthy differences. But I think the main thing about it is actually realizing them and consulting with your members or consulting with the groups that you're trying to target um, and asking them what it is that they want to get from their club and um, how they feel that they, do they feel part of the club? Is there anything else that can be done in order to make them feel more part of it? Because the last thing you want is for somebody just to show up, play and disappear immediately. Um, you know, the clubs can offer so much more, whether it's from the bar, whether it's from functions and um, for fundraisers, whatever it might be. So I think it's about really giving that sense of ownership to its members, but listening to its members um, and then surveying focus groups, consultations, whatever it is, keep checking in with them to see, you know, what, how, is, how else can we make you feel welcome? But then more importantly, that you have some of those members on your committees, on your boards, whatever it might be, so that it's um, very much a shared decision-making and then the best decisions can be made. Perfect, yeah, no, I definitely think that's a very well-made point. Um, so we're gonna move on to, to Mary O'Connor. Thanks very much, Nora. Um, so next up, we will hear from Mary, who is the CEO of Federation of Irish Sport. Um, as Nora mentioned, she had a busy day yesterday confirming um, the significant funding for sport from uh, budget 2021. Um, so outside of sport, Mary, uh, Mary has worked in sport all through her career, I believe, but um, Mary has a, a, a very well established fair playing career in Capogian football, has 12 All-Irelands, I believe, um, over a 16 year period, a, a dual inter-county period for playing for Cork. Um, so basically the Federation of Irish Sport have been the lead organization working on the 20 by 20 campaign um, over the past two years alongside the agency Along Came a Spider. Um, so the campaign will come to a culmination next week with a really exciting online conference. Um, but we're gonna hear from Mary about why 20 by 20 has been so groundbreaking and, and what's next for women in sport. So thank you Mary for being with us today and I'll let you carry on from there. 
Thanks, Carla. Uh, happy Wednesday, everybody, over the hump day. Um, I have 10 minutes, uh, so I'll be brief. Um, I won't, uh, won't be dead by PowerPoint. Um, I am from Cork. I tend to speak fast, so uh, bear with me. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my uh, PowerPoint there now. Okay, so I'm hoping that at this stage uh, that people are aware of the 20 by 20 campaign. Um, it was it launched on actually the 15th of October, uh, two years tomorrow. Um, it was to try and stimulate conversation around women and girls in sport and to have uh, a change in perception, uh, shift in mindset and to challenge the status quo. Um, it was the first of its kind in the sense that it was unifying all national governing bodies and local sports partnerships behind uh, three key messages for women in sport. As Nora outlined, uh, back in 2005, Sport Ireland started dedicating uh, funding to women in sport. But this campaign was unique in the sense uh, that it was the first of its kind in trying to actually unify everybody to come behind the same message. Um, the three main pillars were to increase media coverage of women and girls in sport. Um, and obviously media coverage is across both print, radio, online, uh, socials and so on also to try and increase tw by 20% attendances at major events and competitions, and also to try and increase participation by 20% um, over the two years. Now, it's important to, I suppose, to point out that we knew that in a two-year period, we were not going to change the world, and neither did, we, neither did we think we could. What we wanted to try and show was that when you unify people under something that resonates with them, and it can stimulate a uh, behavioral change, it can stimulate a cultural change. And um, so obviously we're coming to the, the climax of the 20 by 20 campaign. We have still seen huge gains and, and huge achievements um, in that time. I think it's important to say also that we had 76 uh, people, 76 organizations, be they national governing bodies or local sports partnerships who signed up to the 20 by 20 uh, campaign by signing a charter and in that charter the NGB or LSP would have committed to achieving either one or three of the aims I've just spoken about um, and it would tie back into their own agenda their own strategic objectives and that was the beauty of it this is something that um, they wanted to try and achieve for their own members and their own organization. And that, this was just from the launch day um, two years ago just again trying to point out that a lot of the media cover that we speak about is at the end of our own hand in terms of our, of our phones and socials through social media in terms of Instagram, Twitter and so on. And it's talking about actually taking the responsibility of ensuring our own coverage as well. So that's just a brief uh, outlook at that. Um, I'm going to focus more or less on this PowerPoint page if I, if I can. The reason being is the campaign over the two years had uh, five different chapters. And each chapter had its own message. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to talk about each, each uh, line there, but also to get you to think about your own organizations, think about golf and see where it's coming from from there. So the first hashtag was, if she can't see it, she can't be it. And what we were trying to prove there was, if a young girl did not um, see her heroes or see anybody that you know, she could emulate, it was very difficult for her to actually you know, achieve but also it was very difficult for her to be inspired and, and, and so on. So it was a vicious circle. You're not going to increase participation. You're not going to increase um, attendance if you don't increase uh, visibility. So following the, the launch um, of the campaign, we went to International Women's Day uh, the first year, which was Show Your Stripes. And Show Your Stripes is really a call to action. We were asking individual organizations who had signed the charters to publicly say what their commitment was, but also individuals. Uh, to speak about what they are, what they said that they were going to do to try and support women and girls in sports. So you had celebrities, you had uh, clubs of all different sports, you had individuals just commenting on how they were going to support maybe their daughter's involvement or their niece's involvement, uh, and, and so on. So the Show Your Stripes campaign was a huge success um, in year one, um, and what it proved to us is that it wasn't just. A campaign for women. It was a campaign for all of society because we needed to ensure that we were um, having these difficult conversations, challenging maybe the conscious and unconscious bias uh, that there is out there towards women and girls in sport. So that was a real first impactful uh, chapter that we had. And the second two I'll take together, which was just one and hero your hero. 
Um, and what that was about was it just showed you that um, for, for just one that we needed just one person to believe in a girl's ability or a team's ability and actually to demonstrate their support for them. And the Hero Your Hero was an opportunity for, for women uh, who had been positively influenced uh, by a coach, uh, by a, an elite player and having an impact on them to actually achieve uh, as, as an individual themselves, but also maybe to say thank you because only for you, I probably wouldn't have been an international um, soccer player or achieved a professional status as a golfer and, and so on. So that was a really important uh, piece and it brought me back to maybe when I was playing uh, sport as, as a young girl, I ended up playing boys teams an awful lot in, in my area just to get the opportunity to play. And I had somebody who really believed in me who actually supported me. It was a difficult time, obviously, as, a, as the only girl on a, an all-boys team, um, but hurling and football. And that support really stood to me and it kind of gave me the confidence to stay playing. Um, and that one leads on to the show your skill bit. There's a perception out there that women and girls sport isn't as skillful um, as, as the men's sport. And you know, you know that kind of a comparison is, is decades old. Old. But what we were trying to do with Show Your Skill was we were inviting individuals, teams, uh, young girls to actually send in video and content of them actually uh, performing a skill. It could be hockey, it could be golf, it could be in any sport. And we got inundated with young girls sending in themselves practicing their skills or demonstrating how skillful they were. And that was a really important piece because it just showed you the talent is out there. And again, we pushed that out through our social channels to ensure that people were kind of educated that girls are really skillful. And then obviously we supplemented that where we had elite Irish athletes demonstrating their own skills as individuals and as part of teams um, as well. The audience is everything. It was really, really um, important because what we were saying was that you know, there's absolutely skill in the game. We'd actually seen that there's loads of girls playing sport, but there wasn't anybody attending um, events and so on. So then if you weren't attending, yeah, you were missing out. So we tried to get across the message that audience um, is everything. And the important thing that we wanted to try and see was that we if we can actually increase people at going to games and events, like you see the young girl there looking over the fence at, at girls playing hockey, we want that to become the norm. We want to change uh, that, you know, the fact that these games are going on and nobody knows that they're going on. And that kind of ties into the women in sports calendar that the, the Federation of Irish Sport created. Um, the calendar was the first of its kind as well, where we got all the fixtures of events, games, matches, and so on at a high level from each of the organizations that have signed up to us. And we populated the calendar. So if an individual wanted to know when Ireland were playing a, a soccer match, or when we'll say there, were, there was a hosting of a, a, a judo European championships, where it was on and when it was on. So to give them the opportunity to actually go to these events and show their support. Um, and that was a really um, well-subscribed calendar. Obviously 20 by 20, but the 2020 put the kibosh on an awful lot of uh, activities this year, but still we were able to populate the calendar. And also it allowed journalists who possibly weren't kind of covering uh, the female side of sports, the opportunity to look at the calendar and see what events uh, were coming up um, as well. The Shaping the Future one was the second year of the, um, of the International Women's Day Show Your Stripes. So it's going to show your stripes and shape the future. And what that was, we were trying to ask, get people to question themselves, what role are they playing in their own communities or in their own clubs around shaping the future for women in sport? And out of that came um, individual club charters. Um, we had over 400 clubs sign up to the 20 by 20 charter, which was free. Um, and obviously they made a commitment to ensure that girls and women was catered for, uh, that there was equality. But in, 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 in response to that, then they received a 20 by 20 flag, which they could fly um, in their local clubs. And would you believe that 27 countries um, the clubs in 27 countries across the world received that flag. So it was it's fantastic for us that people at club level wanted to get involved in the 20 by 20 campaign. It resonated with them. They believed in it um, and they absolutely saw it as a mechanism to drive change and drive conversation at a localized level. And that's what we want to try and ensure that it's not just the organizations at a national level taking lead, but individual clubs are actually buying into the concept that yes, 
absolutely women and girls should be part of the norm. Um, I was thinking um, about this, you know, and I was, I think it was, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think it was last Saturday was um, International Coming Out Day for the LGBTQI community. And what I was saying, and I read it on Twitter, some parent has said that her children were saying, well, in a couple of years, there won't be any need for that day. And what I'm hoping in a couple of years, there won't be any need for us to kind of distinguish women in sport. It'll just be sport. And that's what we're hoping to do in terms of shaping the future around this campaign. And um, the, the last one there, uh, no proving, just uh, no proving, just uh, no moving, just proving. And um, that's wrong, actually. It's no proving, just moving. Um, when I suppose when I was playing sports at a high level, you know, you're always out to prove you were the best and that you were, um, you know, an elite athlete, you wanted to success, you wanted to perform. But the no proving, just moving part of it was just to actually make sure it resonates with every, every woman and girl, regardless of talents, that they can go out and enjoy the sport that they enjoy. So if you think about in golf, and not that I know an awful lot about it, I must say, but if I was playing golf and I was on a, a say, on the golf course and I knew I had one stroke to make a par and I ended up being double bogey or whatever, I could say, well, actually, I'm just playing golf to enjoy it with my friends and, and, and actually to be physically active. And whereas if you're an elite golfer, obviously you want to try and get that eagle, get that birdie and so on. So what we're trying to say with this is, you know, we just want people to be physically active for their own general well-being and we want the campaign to resonate with them as well. So it's for all age cohorts and it's very much inclusive. The Long Road was a documentary which we produced um, talking about where we've come from um, as, a, as a nation around women and girls in sport. It's a documentary that's available um, on the 20 by 20 website. It's 11 minutes long. It's worth viewing. And there's a few uh, lady golfers uh, uh, featured on it as well, so it's worth looking at. Um, and we're coming now tomorrow, and as I said, it's two years, and next week will be the culmination of the climax of this campaign, and we'll have some research coming out to see, well, how successful the campaign is, was. But Choose What Next is essentially, it's up to us, and that's what we were talking about in the campaign, is change is the responsibility of us all. And it's all about ourselves making individual changes, and then any groups that we're part of that we make changes uh, along as well. So. As I said from the outset, Nora and Sport Ireland, that, you know, that's the policy, that's a sustainable piece. This was a call to arms, it was a call to action. It was actually about uniting uh, different organizations under the One Women in Sport banner about actually supporting ourselves, but also encouraging people and educating people about women in sport and also about ensuring that we have those difficult conversations and that we challenge what is, has been the norm uh, up to now. And just to finish, um, as I said, we had the first women in sport calendar. In the two years, we've had six uh, elite attendance records broken uh, for five sports, and there has been an increase um, in media coverage. I think it's safe to say that we have a, a long way to go in terms of print media, but I think in terms of online, socials, radio, uh, television broadcast, that absolutely um, ha has increased. As I said, we also will uh, next week be releasing um, the outcomes of the benchmark data that our national and governing bodies would have given to us at the beginning of the campaign under participation and so on. And we'll be able to see what well, has that had an impact, the campaign had an impact uh, for them over the last two years. As the slide says there, uh, lots, more, lots done more to do, uh, st still hurdles to jump. Um, I think what's happening today and what's been happening um, by in the last number of weeks has been fantastic. I think it's been lauded. I think the support from Sport Ireland in terms of funding and so on makes a real different difference. And I think, you know, there will be huge outputs uh, from this type of work. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity for presenting today. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, it's actually amazing to see when you have it all in one slide, what has actually been done uh, over the last two years. And, and I suppose, we, well, we've been involved in it, we've just been keeping going, but now we're able to look back and kind of establish what has been done. And um, I suppose like you, obviously you grew up and you mentioned there in, in an era where girls playing sport wasn't the norm. And I know you have your own stories about, like you mentioned there, about trying to, to fit into the boys' teams and stuff like that. But has there been a moment across the past, I suppose, two years where you maybe sat back and were thinking, okay, wow, well, this is actually is making an impact. Has, was there any one, I suppose, coverage or, or record-breaking attendance that, that uh, really stood out to you? 
Um, I, mean, I think the question has a couple of answers. I suppose when I was growing up, um, and I'm not on, but when I was growing up, obviously playing with the boys, I did any, everything I could to fit in. And uh, so, for instance, I used to cut my hair up short so they would not know that I was a girl. And um, especially if I was wearing a helmet for hurling, they had no idea that I was a girl until the game was over. Um, then they'd they start to slagging and, and so on. But like I remember when I was playing, you know, you did so much to try and prove yourself uh, in those games. And I remember one day playing a game and the boy I was marking a hurling game gave me a, a bent of a shoulder, took off of the ball and, 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 and so on. And kind of looked at me to say like, oh, you're only a girl. And, you know, two minutes later, I got the ball and I gave him a bent of a shoulder and I scored a point. And I, I was a long kind of going back telling him, like, you know, I'm here. But to answer your point, I suppose I was at the hockey uh, international when they qualified for the Olympics. And to see the crowd, that was one of the record breaking attendances. It was also televised. It just get, filled me with emotion because I was so delighted to see that Irish society is really starting to catch up now. Uh, you know, there's only a few sports in the world where there's a kind of a party. Um, in terms of women's coverage, and that's probably the likes of tennis and, and so on. And like, I, I went away from that game thinking, God, you know, we're all making a difference here. The campaign is very much public facing. It's kind of that social movement piece. It's increasing the visibility. And then you have the work that Nora and Sport Ireland are doing um, at a national governing body level and a local sports partnership level to make that sustainable. So although they're separate uh, pieces of work, they do complement each other. And um, obviously the campaign is going to end next week, but I do think it, it has definitely given a platform now for women and girls to be spoken about in a, in a non-patronizing way. And I think that's really, really important, you know. Definitely, definitely. And thank you very much uh, for speaking with us. That was, that was really interesting. Um, Next up, we, we invited uh, Stephen Cullerton, who, who couldn't make it with us live today, but I have a pre-recorded piece um, that, that he uh, did with me. So basically, um, Stephen is an Associate Director in Management Consulting with KPMG and is the Chair of the Golf Society in the organization. Um, he is a, a key partner of the, the 20 by 20 are a key partner with KPMG. Um, so Stephen questioned why there were, were so few women um, playing in their golf society events, despite the 1500 women that, that work at the firm. So he decided to make a change um, and create a corporate get into golf campaign. So I am just going to share this with you here. Hopefully. I'm gonna let him speak. I was the chairman of the, the KPMG Golf Society for the past five or six years now at this stage. And it, it was something I, I grew up around an awful lot of women's golf and through through my mum, who was uh, the, the manager of the Irish team when I was a kid. So that's how I made my pocket money was caddying for, for those guys. And it was something that was very blatantly missing in our society was a strong female participation. Um, so it's been something that that has been in my mind over the last couple of years, and we've been trying to find the right meaningful way of getting people into golf that avoids the usual kind of tokenism of getting a few really good players to, to come along and, and be the representation. So with the help of, of Anne McCormick and, and Golf Ireland and, and Hazel Cavanaugh over in Leopardstown, we came up with a plan uh, that was three phased in terms of getting women into golf and um, particularly the, the feedback we had always got was i'd love to but my golf game isn't good enough for for that kind of standard and we play really good golf courses and um, there was a little bit of hesitation on that side so we felt by having a kind of a, an, an 18 month three phase program it's about building up that confidence of of getting comfortable to actually go out and, and, and play on these courses. Um, so we, we reached out just to gauge the, the levels of interest within the firm and we sent an email to the 1500 women who, who are in the firm. We got about 15% of, of the women came back uh, with expressing an interest in, in taking part. So in our first phase, we got just over 100 women to participate in, in, in lessons in Leopardstown over a six-week period in, in smaller groups of 10 to 12. 
Very good. And I suppose like, yeah, they, they, even the 15%, that's quite a large number given the, yeah. the women that work at KKMG. And um, I suppose, what was the level, was the level kind of a, a vast, like from complete beginners to people that had maybe hit a few shots before to people who had played regularly? The vast majority were beginners. So um, I think we had 85 beginners, maybe 14 or 15 improvers, and then one or two people who were experienced who uh, would have been the, the one or two names on the timesheet that that um, were up every uh, every event that we put on. So um, it was really good to have them there for moral support. And I guess even when we took people out to the course eventually, to, to talk about what the what the standard um, uh, rules and and um, considerations are for other players and all of that kind of just to get people more more uh, comfortable on the course. Very very good. So they obviously went through a, a few sessions with Hazel, and I suppose from there, how has it progressed? Obviously, this was kind of last year. Um, I think yeah. I was talking to you about it. So, um, how has it progressed so far? Obviously, with COVID, it might have affected a little bit. Um, but is the interest still there with with the with the women? Yeah. So the interest is definitely still there. When we reached back out to that core group to see about interest in in phase two, there was almost unanimous um, interest in in progressing. So we're into phase two now. We've got the first 40 up and running in terms of their, their first lessons. Obviously, trying to get scheduling now is, is quite difficult with golf courses and, and driving ranges being booked out all over the country, uh, which is a, a fantastic uh, thing to see again. So, um, yeah, we're up and running with phase two. There's definite interest. There's, there's certainly challenges in terms of what you would expect to see where people are fully engaged when they're signed up to something and uh, then when that when, when your phase one comes to an end how do you keep people engaged how do you get people out onto golf courses how do you create those smaller networks of people where you're kind of accountable to each other to go out and, and hit a few balls on a on a Saturday or a Wednesday night particularly like, these are all very busy people in their their day-to-day -day jobs and they families at home that they're already abandoning to to, uh, to, to go out and, and play golf and it's like I, I feel the same it's trying to make that time for golf unless you've an accountability to someone or to a group and that's always been the great thing about team sports if you don't show up to training people miss you it's, it's it can be different with golf particularly if you're not part of a regular group of play. Yeah, this, that's a really good point. Obviously, having the that kind of cohort of people together and starting kind of going through the journey together works really well. What kind of like obviously this is a cohort of of like you said like busy working people. So, um, what sort of the feedback has been as, as to why maybe golf is beneficial for that group to to get involved in? Obviously, I, I know like golf can be great for like networking and things like that. But is any that sort of shown through in the feedback that you've got? Definitely, yeah, and it's. I think it's reinvigorated a love of sport for a lot of them. So you've got lots of people who played hockey, who played Gaelic football, who played camogie growing up, uh, and you find that they're the ones who take take most naturally to the game. But it reinvigorates that learning a new skill again. And once people get out, the hardest part is the same. I do a bit of running and a bit of cycling. The hardest part is actually getting on the gear and going out and committing to it. And it's very easy to make excuses tired or the weather is not exactly perfect or the traffic's going to be bad but um, that's that seems to be the, the the bit that people find most difficult is that getting out but once you're out you're out in the fresh air and um, you're constantly particularly when you're a beginner is it's like anything it's when you make the most progress in the sport uh, and I see the guys in in the No Laying Up podcast in the States one of them is is now playing for the last six months left-handed because he wanted to feel that buzz of learning how to play golf again. So he started from scratch left-handed. And I guess that's what a lot of these these um, these women feel when they're they're taking up a, a new sport. So sorry, I didn't do a quick um outfit change there or anything like that um, uh, that was pre-recorded with uh, with Stephen. And it's kind of a case study, I suppose, as to how some of the 
uh, reasoning behind uh, women getting into sport and, and obviously they, they were questioning as to why um, the women weren't getting involved and things like um, it being that they're not feeling like they were good enough or not having um, I suppose not, not knowing the, what to do when they get to the golf course or not having the equipment and things like that so they were sort of barriers to stopping that participation so that was something that Stephen found and they've implemented really well um, and not without the help of CGI um, and our next speaker um, Anne McCormack who a lot of you will know very well um, so obviously Anne has had many years experience working in golf uh, and has been instrument instrumental I suppose in the development of the level power program so she was responsible initially in developing the get into golf program and um, from a pilot initiative to the success that it is today. Um, initially, Anne started volunteering at her own club when she was 16 years old. Um, she managed the coordination of volunteers at the Ladies Irish Open at the Solheim Cup uh, before taking up her role with, with CGI um, and ultimately taking over as the as the, the head of club support and participation. So Anne's passion for, for speaking about this uh, topic is, is palpable. Um, and I know she's very excited to speak with us. So Anne, I will let you take it away. Yeah, I think Carla's being uh, facetious there. She knows how much I hate public speaking. Um, whilst I do love talking about this topic, I much prefer to, to dream uh, into the future as to things that could be better. And look, we're very fortunate to work for an organization that allows us to do that, that allows us to dream, um, and that we have a team of people who equally dream with us and try to implement anything that comes up. Uh, I should say there's been many ideas that I've come up with that our team have looked at me um, with many heads thinking this definitely will not work and in many cases they were right um, we have failed many times um, and but there was also things that have really stood to us and, and we're starting to really see success happening um, and I suppose that's development as a whole it's something that needs to be tried and tested and we constantly have to keep moving um, and developing because um, if we stand still we're simply never going to get to where we believe we can get to um, so I'm going to share my screen hopefully this goes all right I should say I desperately hate it it's public speaking so my voice could shake um, I promise I won't cry um, but it may sound like I will <laughs> as Carla mentioned I volunteered in my club at the age of 16 and um, I suppose um, I started off and there was lots of girls playing golf um, and each year and um, at some points each month um, the numbers started to dwindle and dwindle um, where at some points I was the only girl playing golf I don't know this is having it's jumping on but anyway um, I was the only girl that was playing golf uh, and it was always something that I was really interested in from a really young age as to why were the girls dropping out uh, and I suppose even at that age I really wanted to be part of the solution I wanted to fix it um, so I hounded the Connacht district I hounded the ILGU um, and really was asking, please help me, um, sorry, please let me help you, um, because I, I, I believed that I could do something. Um, I was probably very naive looking back. Um, however, as soon as I began to work in golf as, as a volunteer and then as an employee, I realized that in order to fix the issue, we needed to first understand it. Um, growing up, I'd always heard things like, there, there's not enough women on committees, um, there's way more girl, boys playing golf than there is girls. Um, but I suppose it was really important for us to really understand what that meant. What did that landscape look like? We've already heard from Stephen um, about kind of on the women's side. So this is just really focusing on some of the participation um, trends for girls golf. So girls making up less than 2% of golf club membership. Uh, into, this is from 2018. Um, the number of girls in golf clubs was still decreasing at that point. Um, however, the number of girls participating in, in club level was increasing, and that was largely down to the ILGU implementing um, the, the girls policy, which clubs had to allow um, girls to play in competitions, and that really, really helped with participation. You'll see there that the number of girls playing off 36 was 824, and there was only 804 girls that had a handicap of less than 36. Uh, you'll see that the largest portion, the 3,143, had no handicap or a handicap of 36. And for us, that was quite concerning because what we could see through the trends was that those who didn't have a handicap were less engaged. They were feeling less confident, less competent, uh, and therefore were most likely to drop out. Um, and in, in, in the same situation, in terms of the coaching landscape, um, we started to understand that there was only 43% of clubs with a resident pro that had no, no girls that were members of clubs. So there's actually 127 clubs 
that had no girls as members, which is a very, very high portion of our clubs. Um, what we started to see though, was that clubs that had two or more resident PGA professionals had a greater number of juniors, that's both boys and girls. Um, and for us, this was a really, really important finding that the average number of girls was 50% higher than the national average when there was a fem female resident PGA professional in place. So, um, you know, when we talk about level par, um, the four pillars that Nora mentioned and the four pillars we've gone through for the last few weeks, each one of them has a knock on effect to participation. We can't grow our sport unless some of those other um, issues in each of the pillars are tackled. Um, which is why we developed this four pillar um, model of level par. Uh, I should say that um, it, the first slide would, it would have covered, um, you know, this was all done in consultation with huge volumes of people. Um, you know, we didn't do this on our own. Um, we spoke to large numbers of organizations that have gone through this. We surveyed our female members uh, we got um, stats from, you know, GUI ADMs. Um, we really, really wanted to understand the trends. And I think Nora mentioned it earlier on, the importance of, you know, understanding the market that was there. So when we were looking, particularly in the area of participation, um, of how we were going to increase the number of women and girls, well, we had to talk to them. We had to talk to women who had never played before. We needed to understand what their fears were. Um, and, and that's where we developed um, the Get Into Golf program. Uh, which has continued to evolve through the years and, and we're very lucky and it's the same for the girls program it'd be very wrong if a group of adults uh, decided to design a program for young girls um, who live in a very very different world than we did when we might have been 10 11 12 so it's really important to get their feedback there was many people who thought we were crazy to go and try and get young groups of kids to to into rooms and consult with them uh, because you know what they'd come out with something wacky uh, for me, that was the, the best moments um, of my career to date was spending time with those kids because um, actually they give so much hope for what the future could look like um, and, you know, how we could break down some of the barriers. And yes, there was some wacky ideas about having, you know, sweets on every second tree in their golf club. Uh, that's how they think that they'd like to stick it out. But you know what? Um, we, we took on an awful lot of their feedback. Um, I remember in Mullingar Golf Club, we had a disco because they were mad to have a disco after golf. Um, so some of our volunteers were seen line dancing. Some of our international players were doing all sorts of dances um, and the girls just had a brilliant time. Uh, and the importance of listening to everybody concerned, whether it be PGA professionals, whether it be board members, whether it be committee members of clubs, but really, really engaging with every level. And I think that's probably the success of, of the Level Power program. So you'll see here on this slide, um, I suppose, the commitment. We're very lucky that Golf Ireland um, have committed to level par moving in to next year, which means that the programme can continue to evolve. Um, and we're very obviously very fortunate to have Sport Ireland's backing, um, as well as the support that we've gotten from the Federation, the RNA and, and the PGA and Sport NI. Uh, but you'll see, you know, recently we launched our Women in Charter you'll have seen the Golf Ireland commitments. Um, and that really is that call to action that Mary spoke about. It's uh, Golf Ireland really committing in paper what they're going to do to increase and make um, the environment better for females. Um, and you'll see the pil pillar elements um, there as well for coaching and officiating, participation, governance and visibility. Um, I suppose for participation that we're talking about today, we had a range of things that came under that participation pillar, which was the expansion of Get Into Golf, um, Golf for Girls for Life. We continued to expand that and, and actually create an environment outside of that, the clubs, because the, the national average um, for girls is only nine per club. Uh, and when you break that down, there's probably only two that have a handicap. So we needed to create a different environment. And this funding has allowed us to create that bubble outside of their own clubs. Golf Sixes was the first tournament um, that boys and girls could kind of compete at with, to, sorry, compete with together um, and go on and represent their club at regional level. Uh, we published that last year and it worked really well and we've, we've done the same this year. Um, and as Nora said, that this is something that's really important as part of the transition into Golf Ireland, um, this whole coming together. And um, we started to see, you know, 
men and, and women joining together, the junior conveners having conversations when in a lot of clubs they had really done very separate programs for their boys and girls. Uh, and for sure there's a need for that at times, but it's great now that they're starting to have conversations uh, and link up where they can. Um, you'll see there um, the top picture, it's, you know, that's one of our activation programs uh, that ran last year. Uh, and that was in an effort to, you know, grow the number of female um, leaders uh, and young leaders that were going to help our young people grow. Uh, and the bottom one was all around, you know, we got a number, I think we have about 50 ambassadors um, across the country, which is mostly made up of our international golfers, all from, you know, they've got different experiences. They love golf for different reasons. They've got to travel and things like that. And for them to spend time with some of our young girls from across the country has been really, really positive um, and definitely helped, you know, retain some of our girl members. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try and uh, wrap up. But I think what we can see from this year is that for both women and girls, golf club membership for the last two years has increased. Uh, the number of girls participating in clubs has increased. We started to see the number of girls with their six handicap or less, um, you know, that's, we're starting to see a huge shift there in terms of, you know, girls getting handicaps and actually reducing there. So again, showing um, significant signs that we're retaining these girls, which is really important to us. Um, I don't gonna have time to share this. I don't think Carla, cause you'll give out to me, um, but hopefully when, when it's circulated, it's a really, really good um, video that showcases um, a really good success story in Westport Golf Club as to how they've grown their girls from five to now 50 and I think growing all the time um, and that was done in the space of a year and all it took was just solid commitment um, from the club um, and some good support structures put in place and um, working with our team um, so yeah the the coaching landscape look we've been we've been lucky our activator program was picked up and it's something that's going to be run across GB&I in conjunction with the RNA and hopefully the PGA um, and that's exciting because I think that will definitely help grow participation of both boys and girls, but in particular girls, because we can actually start to get more females in, in that space um, and working with young girls. Um, lots of people always ask what the secret to success that we're having is. Um, I'd argue that we're not quite where we want to be. It's certainly moving in the right direction, um, but there is no magic wand. Um, this won't happen overnight um, it didn't the problem didn't happen overnight and it definitely won't be solved overnight uh, but i think you know collaboration is key we've worked with so many amazing people um, and even the organizations we've worked with when we mentioned sport ireland it's not just about getting funding from them you know nor is always on the other end of the phone to support um, and link us up with other organizations and and mary is the same so you know, when we talk about support from organizations, it's really important that we're not seeing it just as a monetary thing. Uh, it's certainly been about networking and connecting with other organizations. And I think by doing that uh, and our own team and how they've connected with their own golf clubs uh, and local sports partnerships, um, it's definitely, um, well, it's a stepping stone to the key to success and it's becoming everybody's, uh, on everybody's radar versus, you know, whoever is leading out on the program. So yeah, I'll wrap up there for you, Carla. Thank you very much. Um, I wouldn't have given out to you for going over time, <laughs> but what I will do is share that video when I circulate the, the recording and stuff afterwards, because um, it's a nice piece about um, how Westport have grown their, their girls um, from a very small number to, to um, quite a large number and one of the largest probably in the country. Um, I, I just want to follow up on what Anne said there, I suppose, and touch on and thank Nora and Mary for being involved today. Um, like, the, like she said, that it's, it's great that there are so many bodies working collaboratively um, in this and that it's, it's not, it's, we all are sort of working towards a common goal. There may be different ways of doing things, but we're all sort of ultimately trying to get um, to, to a, a place that we all want to be. So thank you very much to, to both Nora and Mary for being involved today. Um, I just wanted to pass on a message to, to all our speakers speakers and everything that has been everyone who's been involved in the four um webinars uh, from from on behalf of the transition board of golf ireland and, and tim o'connor the chair and um, really want to just thank everybody and and for for i suppose making it such a success and and i suppose one of the first things where we've all collaboratively worked together and um, in, in moving in towards golf ireland so thank you very much to, to everybody who has been involved um, 
I, yes, like I said, this is the last webinar. So what I will do is circulate the recording um, afterwards as usual, and they will be available for viewing. Um, but again, thank you to our three speakers today and, and I hope everybody has a lovely afternoon. Thanks, Carla.